Isaiah 61 and verse 1, and if that scripture looks familiar, it's the same one we used last Sunday. And uh, the wonderful thing is, God's word is never redundant. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to them that are bound. Listen again. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That should be the motto of every child of God. That should be what you believe about yourself. All right. Hold that thought and let me tell you this. In Old Testament days, as the celebration of Passover was approaching, a good Jewish family would be going through the house looking for any trace of leaven, making sure there was none, removing any that was there because they knew that leaven represented sin and its effect on their life. Devout Jews would not associate with anyone who was a known sinner. They were unclean. So they, there was, if they knew it, they would not even speak to. They also avoided contact with Gentiles. That was anybody that did not follow the Jewish faith. They stayed away from, of course, anyone that was sick, infirm in any way, and of course, people with leprosy were absolutely uh, anathema for anything, for lack of a better term. I mean, you didn't want to even see one, much less be around them. So they had to stay outside the camp. Dead bodies, you didn't want to touch one of those because you would be defiled, you'd become unclean. So they shunned all contact with anything that they perceived would defile them. Then Jesus came. Now that in itself should be grounds to shout. Then Jesus came. And he did the exact opposite, didn't he? He went to those that were shunned, those that were banished, those that were avoided, those that were locked outside the camp, so to speak, and he touched them. And rather than becoming contaminated or defiled, they became clean. He touched the diseased and dead bodies, and he, instead of becoming unclean, gave health and life to them. He companied with sinners, and instead of becoming corrupted, the sinners became clean. Since Jesus came, instead of being told to stay away from the unclean, he tells us to go. Now, the sad thing is, we have so much of that thought within us that we're going to be defiled if we get around somebody that's not as we are or as we perceive ourselves to be. But Jesus said, I am with you. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Over in Mark chapter 16, he begins to say how it should be. You remember that part. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. And he goes on. He said, they'll speak with new tongues. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. We're supposed to go to the defiled. We're supposed to go to the unclean. We're supposed to go to those that don't know him. We're supposed to go to those that are hurting. And instead of being defiled ourselves, we're supposed to change them by his spirit in us. Now, having said all that, let's go back and talk about leaven for a few minutes. I've heard people preach and teach that every reference to leaven in the Bible was a reference to sin. Even, even Schofield, who I admire so much, said the same thing. But I, you know, depart from him in that respect. I don't agree with him. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. As I was talking with the young folks this morning, Jesus was talking about what the kingdom was like. 
Now, the kingdom is where a king reigns. That's his domain. And when Jesus came, he began to tell people that the kingdom was at hand. He would send his disciples into cities where he was himself going to come shortly thereafter. And he said, you go into that place and you heal the sick and, and do what is needed and share the good news with them and tell them that the kingdom is at hand. Well... A lot of people think that because Jesus was rejected and crucified and went back to heaven that the kingdom is no longer at hand. But let me tell you, it is. It's within you. The Bible says the kingdom is within you right now. So you have the kingdom of God within you. And wherever you go, if you're walking in obedience to him, the kingdom's going with you. Do you understand that? I can tell you the reason. Here's why. Because Jesus said, go into all the world, and lo, I am with you always. So if the king is with you, and his spirit is within you, then you are in the kingdom of God. And wherever you go, the kingdom is going with you. We need to get a hold of that. We need to get that mindset. We think that we're in this, in this world and we're a defeated bunch and the, you know, we're greatly outnumbered and we can't do a thing against all that's taking place. The reason we can't is because we have the wrong perspective. The reason we can't is because we have the same mindset that those spies had that went into the promised land. And when they saw the walled cities and when they saw the giants that lived therein, they said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. And, that's, and because of that, we are like grasshoppers in their sight and in our own sight as well. And because of that, because of a lack of faith, because they didn't realize and didn't pause to think that God's kingdom was with them. Because everywhere they went, God went with them. His angel went with them. He rained down manna from heaven. He brought water out of a rock. He parted the Red Sea. He fought the battles for them. The kingdom was with them. And they could have went in and taken the land. But because of their perception, because of their mindset, they couldn't do it. And because of our perception and because of our mindset, we can't do it either. And something has to be done about that. We have to change the way we think. That's the reason Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Repent means to change your mind. Change the way you think. All right, let's talk about leaven for a minute. Mark, or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter uh, 13. Verse 31, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it's grown, it's the greatest among herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. As I read that, what it says to me is this. It started small and then it really began to grow. Well, it did. It started with 120 in an upper room. And when the Holy Spirit came, they emptied out. And the first day, there was 3,000 people added. So, boy, we had an exponential growth, didn't we? Then we go to the next one. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is likened to leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Listen, God wants us to take the kingdom and go into the world and change the world around us. Now, I am not preaching some dominion theology i'm not telling you that the church is going to take over the world and once we get it taken over jesus is going to come back and say thank you very much that's not going to happen that way but i will tell you this that wherever we go the kingdom is with us and we can influence those about us and if all christians had that mindset we could truly turn the world upside down but we can affect the we can affect the world that we can touch and there's going to be a lot of people that come to know Jesus Christ and there's going to be a lot of change because eventually i believe with all my heart christians are going to get hold of this and there's going to be a tremendous move of god i believe that all right now so jesus is comparing the kingdom to leaven And he's talking about the leaven of the kingdom. But there's two other kinds of leaven that Jesus also talks about. Go with me to Mark chapter 8. In Mark chapter 8, and let's begin in verse 13. Let's begin in verse 10. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came to the parts of Dalmanthua. 
And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit, and he said, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you that there shall no sign be given to this generation. And he left and entered into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, Why reason you because you have no bread? Perceive you not yet, neither understand. Have you your heart yet hardened? Having eyes you see not, and having ears you hear not, do you not remember? When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments you took up? And they said, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? All right. So many times we don't understand either. What indeed Jesus was talking about was what affects the way you think. Just like that leaven caused that eruption in that bottle this morning. Leaven comes into our mind and causes our mind to do certain things. Well, if it's the leaven of the kingdom, it causes us to erupt with the power of God. But if it's the leaven of the world, it has the exact opposite effect, and we erupt with things that are wrong. But Jesus specified two types of leaven. He said the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now remember, he's talking to his disciples. In essence, he's also talking to the church. He wasn't specifically talking to the world. All right, what would, those, what would those things be? Now, remember, what he's talking about is something that in, influences the way they think. In fact, another place in Scripture, one of the gospel writers talks about, and they understood that he was talking about the doctrine or the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees when he was talking about the leaven. All right, let's think for a minute. What, what, was, he, what was he talking about? Well, what would the leaven of Herod be? <clears throat> well, if you think about Herod... Herod was somebody that didn't trust in God. Herod was somebody that trusted in his own ability. Herod trusted in his greatness, in his political power. Herod trusted in his military might. Herod trusted in his position and supposed power. So when Jesus warned his disciples against this, I believe what he was saying was this. Don't trust in your abilities. Don't trust in man-made systems. Don't trust in programs, don't trust in politics, don't trust in anything that man has control over. The Bible says the arm of flesh will fail you. And boy, we know that, don't we? You know, we, we, we choose someone for political office and we think that their pedigree is awesome and we think they're going to be just what we want and we send them into office and it automatically seems that something happens and they forget everything that they promised. You know, there's that old adage that says absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? It appears to be that way. And as long as we are basing our hopes and our dreams and our aspirations on man's abilities or on what we think that we can achieve by our programs, we're going to fall flat on our face. And he was warning those disciples. He said, listen, I don't want you to trust in what you think you can do, what you think you should do. You've got to trust in me and in my leadership and my guidance. Well, what would have been the the leaven of the Pharisee? Well, the Pharisee, the best I can describe it, in my opinion, would be a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. The Pharisees had no personal relationship. They'd never had an experience with God. And everything to them was a formula or a ritual or examining everything with a microscopic lens to see if somebody was deviating from the, either the tradition of the elders or the, or the law of Moses or whatever. They had an explanation for everything. Some kind of logical explanation. You remember when Jesus and his disciples were going along and they met this man that had been born blind? You remember what somebody asked? Master, who sinned, this man or his parents? 
They thought that everything that took place had to fit exactly into their theology and they had this holier-than-thou attitude that condemned everybody that didn't do exactly what they did. (laughs) Somebody, I I get a kick out of this. I was reading a book and, and the author said this. He said, if they met a person who was starving, they would either say it's because of your sin or that God in his sovereignty has arranged for you to be without bread so that you can better identify with those also who have no bread. And besides, the bakery closed with the last of the apostles. (laughs) They had a form of godliness but denied the power thereof. Rather than being compassionate and forgiving towards sinners, the leaven of the Pharisee would have resulted in a holier-than-thou condemnation. And remember, Jesus said, beware of that leaven. As Jesus warned his disciples, too often we, as the church, either trust in our programs, trust in our logic, and in our talents and abilities, rather than depending on the Holy Spirit. Too often... We, as the church, don't want to associate with those that we consider unclean. And we have a holier-than-thou attitude. God, forgive us. God, forgive us. The leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. All right. So what's the leaven of the kingdom? What is it that Jesus was talking about when he said the kingdom of God is like leaven that's hidden in a loaf until the whole loaf rises or the whole loaf is is leavened? Well, here's what I think. I think it's that thought, that concept, that belief, that vision that enables us to see ourselves the way that God sees us. Now, I want you to let that sink in for just a minute. I believe that's the leaven that God wants to affect us and to change us is for us to begin to see ourselves the way that God sees us. Now, how does God see us? How is the church in reality? And please understand this. The reality is not what we perceive The reality is not what we see when we look in the mirror, but the reality is what God says in his word. Think about it. The Bible says the things that we see with our eyes are temporary, but the things that we can't see are eternal. And the way God perceives the church is what reality really is because that's the eternal view of the church. How does he see us? Well, let's think. The Bible says that when somebody becomes a Christian, when they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and they're born again, it says we are a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. So we're new. We may not look new on the outside. We may look just the same to everybody about us, but inside where God's looking, and you remember God looks on the heart. Inside, we're a new creature. That old is passed away. The Bible says that our old man is dead and hidden with Christ in God. The Bible says that we are righteousness because we are righteous because we have been given His righteousness. In fact, if you go over in Revelation and you read about the bride of Christ, when when John was privileged to see them, he said they were clothed in white raiment. And that white raiment was the righteousness of saints. You know, we tend to think that that's something that a person achieves after they've lived a sainted life for many years. But folks, that righteousness is something that is given to a child of God immediately when they're born again. You are never going to become any more righteous than you are the moment you're saved. Because righteousness is not earned. It's given by grace through faith. The Bible says that Jesus has made our righteousness and our sanctification and our redemption and our wisdom and all those things. All right. So God sees us as that old man being dead and us being alive. He sees us as being in Christ. He sees us as being righteous. 
The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit lives within us and greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. The Bible says that we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. The Bible says that we're seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. And we've been given authority over all the enemy's work. Do you know what Satan's strategy is against the church? It's the same one he used against Jesus when Jesus was in the wilderness being tested. Do you remember what his line was? This was his opening line. If you are the Son of God. Jesus was subjected to everything that Satan could throw to make him doubt who he was. And that's exactly what he's doing with the church. He is subjecting you to everything that he can throw at you to make you doubt who you are. He will make you doubt your salvation. He will make you doubt your righteousness. He will make you doubt your commitment. He will make you doubt the fact that you're going to heaven and not to hell. He will make you doubt that you have any right to witness to any person. He will make you feel so unworthy and so guilty and so condemned that you don't feel any higher than this. That's his plan. It didn't work with Jesus, but maybe it will work with us. And man, I'll tell you, it has. We see ourselves as just those grasshoppers, you know, in relation to the giants that we face. But we need the leaven of the kingdom. We need that mindset that changes, that says, I can do all things through Christ. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit is living in us. And the Holy Spirit was the formative force that brought a universe into existence under the leadership of Jesus Christ at the thought of the Father. That's who's in us, is this dynamite power. And we can change the world if we'll just let the leaven that affects our mind be the leaven of the kingdom of God. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Over in Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> Paul writes, beginning in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right. What's the will of God? That none should perish, that all should come to repentance. The will of God is for us to prosper. The will of God, I believe, is for us to be in health. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, he said, listen, this is how you need to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What did he say next? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In earth as it is, as it is in heaven. God wants his will done on this earth, in this earth, as it is in heaven. And when you stop and think about what it's like in heaven, folks, this is the way it is. Everybody in heaven is surrendered to the lordship of Almighty God. There's no rebellion going on. Everybody in heaven is in, in a place of joy and a place of peace. There is no sickness in heaven. There's no death in heaven. There's no sadness and there's no sorrow. God wants that to be on earth that way. But, of course, we have an enemy and an adversary. We have a creation that's been twisted by sin. But God wants his people, as they travel through this world, to be affected and infected with the leaven of the kingdom of God so that we can go out and infect the world with the same thing. He wants us to carry the kingdom with us wherever we go. Does that mean that nobody is ever to be sick again or nobody's going to? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that when you go into a situation, God's going to move in that situation. God's going to heal people. God's going to set captives free. God is going to save people. God is going to do miraculous things in the lives of the people when we go in carrying the kingdom of God and believing that his kingdom will come into their life and his will will be done in their life as we surrender to his lordship 
And what is standing in the way is the leaven of the world, the leaven of Herod, the leaven of the Pharisees, and a mindset that tells us that we can't, a mindset that says, no, God doesn't want to heal, a mindset that says, you know, you're going through this because God is punishing you for something. Folks, listen, listen. We have to have our mind renewed. We've got to change the way we think. We've got to change the way we perceive ourselves. And we've got to begin to perceive ourselves the way God perceives us. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who's brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what God wants to do. And that's what God will do if we'll let him. All right. What can we do? Well, we've got to first of all realize this. The world is in desperate need. The world is in desperate need to have a working, active, involved, miraculous God. That's why there are so many religions. That's why there's so much interest in, the, in, in, in psychic phenomena, in the occult, in all this strange, curious stuff. People are desperately looking for power. They're desperately looking for something that will work in their life that's greater than they are. And you and I have the kingdom of God within us. And there is no power in this universe greater than the power of God. There is no kingdom stronger than the kingdom of God. There is no love greater. There's no mercy deeper than the grace and the love and the mercy of God. We have that, and we just have to believe that God wants that kingdom to flow through us to the world around us. And we've got to begin to see us as he sees us and not as condemned because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's the word of God. You're not under condemnation. Jesus has taken it. He's taken it in your place. The church has got to arise. As you read in Isaiah, you keep going through there, and God says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. God's glory is within us, and God wants that glory to be shared with the world. God wants the world to see that there is an almighty God, and that he is not off somewhere ignoring everything that's going on not not willing to take any kind of an active role in the affairs of man but God is there and he's ready for his people to walk into a situation and change that situation just like yeast changes a lump of dough God wants us to do that and in order to do it we have to have our minds transformed realize something everything that Jesus did in this world. He did as a human being. He did as an ordinary man. The difference in Jesus was this. He was surrendered to the will of his father. And he was filled with the Holy Ghost. Those are the two things. And yes, of course, he was sinless. But the two things that enabled Jesus to truly do all those awesome things was being surrendered to the will of God and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Folks, we have that same capability. We can surrender to the Lordship. That's why, that's why uh, Paul wrote those words. Present your body as a living sacrifice. Surrender to Him. And have your minds renewed. Have your mind renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Word of God says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God wants his kingdom to invade, and he wants that kingdom to invade being carried by those who have given their lives to him. That's what it's all about. I was thinking about a verse in Romans chapter 8. And I was thinking about how God was talking about the suffering of this present time. And how even creation was groaning and travailing in pain. Look what the Word of God says here in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. He says, For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Listen, 
for the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. What's he saying? He's saying all of creation is waiting for God's children to be revealed. Now, I know a lot of people say, oh, that's talking about after Jesus returns. No, I believe it's talking about right now. When God's children realize who they are, and when they step out in faith, it's going to shake the world. All of creation is waiting for God's children to become who they truly are. And when that happens, this world will be turned upside down. As I've said so many times before, I'm expecting a tremendous revival. I believe before Jesus returns, there's going to be a revival. And I believe it's going to be a revival like this world has never seen. And I believe that God's people are going to begin to grasp how he sees them. And I believe that they're going to be able to start going forth and walking into impossible situations. And seeing those situations turned around by the power of the kingdom of God. The world's waiting for that. God grant us that we be infected with the leaven of the kingdom. The world's in desperate need. Once we begin to believe who we are, we can meet that need. We can go forth in power. And the word says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Let's bow our heads. Father, I ask you to forgive us for believing a lie. For so long, we've allowed ourselves to be seduced by the enemy when he says, you have no power. Just look at the world around you. It's progressively growing worse. Look at the things that are taking place in your nation. Nothing's changing. For the better, it's, it's, it's all going in another direction. So you are ineffective. You have no power. So why, why, why fight it? But Lord, that's the same lie that he's tried to use with you. He wants us to question, even if we're the children of God, he wants us to question you in that does God really want the best for you? Or is he off somewhere paying no attention? Or is he mad at you and only desires to punish you? God, forgive us for believing that lie. Lord, forgive us for depending on our own abilities or our own programs or things that man has established. God, forgive us when we look down our nose at those that we perceive to be not walking as they should be. God, forgive us when we have that holier-than-thou condemning attitude and realize that only by grace are we saved. It was not some righteous act that we did. It was not some great accomplishment. It was not some pilgrimage that we took, took on. It was not some wonderful benevolence that we did that, that earned us salvation. It was God's amazing grace. We have nothing in which to boast except the cross of Jesus Christ. So I pray today, Lord, that you would forgive our sin. And that you would infuse into each of us that leaven of the kingdom. And that our minds would be transformed and we would begin to believe that we are who you say we are, not who the devil tells us we are. That we would not look at our limitations, but we would look at your limitless ability and power. That the mercy and the grace and the love of God that caused us to be saved would infuse our hearts and we would share it with the world around us. And we would step out in faith, carrying the kingdom of God and expecting, absolutely expecting that when we share the good news with somebody that they would be saved. Absolutely believing that when we pray for a situation that you would resolve it. Absolutely convinced that when we lay hands on the sick and pray for them that they will be healed they will recover absolutely convinced Lord the word says as your faith is so be it unto you so God let us begin to believe that we are who you say we are not who we think we are 
Father, I pray for every person in this room today. Lord, if there's anyone here that has never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if there's anyone here that's never said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, forgive my sin. I believe that you came, died on Calvary's cross for my sin, was buried and rose again three days later, ascended back into heaven. I believe that. And I ask you to be my Savior, and I give my life to you. I know that if they'll pray that prayer, they will be saved. God, I pray that you strengthen and encourage and breathe new life into every one of your children. And that our mind will be the mind of Christ. That we'll see ourselves as you see us, full of power and might. Lord, you told us that we would be able to have power over all the power of the enemy. And God, I know that he trembles at the thought of us ever believing that. But Lord, let us begin to believe let us go forth Father I ask you to heal strengthen, encourage fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit to overflowing and Lord just do what you want to do in us that we might do what you want us to do in the world we love you Jesus you are our all in all and we ask you to go with us now thank you Father in your precious name we pray and everybody said Amen.